Hey everybody, this is War Boss Fitz. Welcome to episode number five of the Scouring of the Sands campaign. This week I was able to actually pin down both of my War Masters to get them to roll some dice. And they rolled a lot of dice. And things ended up interesting. So we've had a pretty large plot development in the campaign. I'm going to go ahead and hand you over to the narrator to explain what the heck happened. In the last episode of the Scouring of the Sands campaign, the Pale Angel and her army drive towards battle with a large Havoc warband on the open desert. Our community of players sent in battle reports. Tales of stunning victories and heartbreaking defeats. The Allied forces clashed with the forces of Havoc across the length and breadth of the valley. Even in the swamps of the undead, there was no peace. With the recent power vacuum left by the loss of two vampire lords, necromancers dueled for power in the mashes of death. A special battle report video was made by Nexus Wargaming, where his relief force of chivalrous kingdom knights ran a blockade of wood elves to join in the action. He also made another video on how to use Universal Battle Simulator to play games of Age of Fantasy regiments digitally. These battle have added into the war score of both armies pumping up their ferocity and boosting morale of the troops at the front. As both war masters entered into the battle, the die was cast. It's been three days. Three days and no word. Nothing? No messengers? No relays? Nothing. It is like the whole army just disappeared. That can't happen, can it? Here in the realm of gods and demons. I don't know, lad. We are in interesting times. Communication with the Angel's army ceased. The last reports they had received was that their army was moving to engage the Havoc forces. Outnumbered but confident in victory because they had the Angel with them. As tensions in the capital escalated, the remnants of the southern army sent to flank the river fortress in the south had arrived. Their exhausted and wounded troops told of the undead armies rising out of the swamps and attacking all before them. With this new threat, and the fear that something had gone terrible wrong with the angels battled the city, went into martial law. Whatever soldiers in the city preparing for siege defense, visions of a bolstered havoc army at the gates in everyone's mind, Arms and armor handed out, and ammunition stocks checked and rechecked. They had been through a siege once already, and were determined to not be caught wanting. The next day, a young cleric burst into the war council's chamber. He shouted that he had been given a vision from the angel to, to join her, his voice audible to those outside the chamber through the open door. The war council hesitant to believe this cleric, some seeing this as the ravings of a madman. With the way he delivered the news soon, the whole city will know of it. If the Havoc army had destroyed the Angel and they were on their way here, sending troops out into the open field was folly. They needed every available man here to stand on the wall. But there was a chance that this vision did indeed occur, and they could not ignore it. A call went out for volunteers. A regiment of questing knights took up the call to venture out and find the Angel's army. They were joined by a contingent of horse marksmen and the young cleric. On the dawn of the fifth day, they set forth. They rode hard through the sand. As the sun began to sink below the mountain peaks of the valley rim, they spotted a lone figure. It was a man wearing the colors of a human empire weapon master. When the knights got near, they could see the man shuffle in the sand, limping and staggering. They called for him, and he spun to look at them. His armor was scorched and dented, his cloth in tatters and his eyes. His eyes were black as pitch. His voice hoarse, he raises his hands towards the knights, moving with the last of his energy. <coughs> so where is your unit? Where is the army? They call out as the regiment approaches this lone figure in the desert. The man falls to the ground and remains silent. The cleric jumps off his horse and sees to the man. He rolls him over in the sand and is repulsed by what he sees. The man's black eyes weep blood even as the cleric can see the man was dead. Exhaustion or something more sinister had taken him. The cleric looks to the knight captain and could only mutter the words. What happened here? 
The mounted force continues on as darkness swallows the valley. Shortly after, pinpricks of fire can be seen in the distance. Campfires. This must be the Havoc army encamped after they destroyed the Angel and her army. The Night Captain calls a halt and sends forward a small scouting squad to get closer to Judge Numbers before they assault the camp. A half dozen knights drop their heavy armor and ride into the darkness. When the scouts get close enough to see figures moving in and out of the firelight, they can tell these are dwarfs. Not like the dwarfs they had fought so far in the campaign. These lacked any of the symbols to the Havoc gods. They seemed to be moving around the camp with purpose, in and out of the firelight carrying barrels and chests, but no weapons. Getting closer that they should dare finally the scout spots a human in the camp. He is being led around by a dwarf holding his hand and sitting on a chest. A bowl of water given to him and he drinks greedily from it. Suddenly the scout hears the cock of a hammer. Hold it there, who are you? A voice speaks from the darkness. A small spark, then a torch lights meters from the night. It was a dwarf with a rifle leveled at the scout. As the rest of the knights enter the dwarf camp, they are told that these dwarfs had arrived the previous day and had come across the aftermath of a great battle. They have been assisting the survivors as they have been trying to figure out what caused this. Soon the knight is presented with one of the human survivors, his face and hands bandaged in blood-soaked rags. All of the survivors were like this, their wounds from battle bandaged and healed but their eyes and hands still bleeding. After making sure that the dwarf's story was true and they weren't holding them as captives, the man told the knight captain and the cleric what happened. The Angel's army charged into the ranks of the Havoc army, smashing against the ranks of warriors. The battle seemed to be in their favor until another Havoc force joined from the south and crashed into their flanks. The battle had turned against the humans. They were being overrun and butchered. An avatar of one of the unholy gods smashed through a steam tank then leapt into the air on its cursed wings. It circled the battlefield until it saw the Angel at the center. It turned over in the air, driving its spears towards Angel at terrible speed. The Angel readied herself and swung her giant axe at the demon, then came a light brighter than the sun. That is where all of the survivors went blind. They fumbled around the battlefield, listening to the screams of the dying, whip cracks of magical power and the constant sound of feathered wings. The knight left the man to rest, and he spoke with the dwarfs on why they came to the valley. They are a strike force from the Dwarf Kingdom sent to bolster the Angel's army and to hunt down their traitorous brothers, the Havoc Dwarfs. The cleric, still consumed by the visions that the Angel had sent him, begged the Knight Captain to press on. The Angel is in need. With much argument, the Captain convinced the cleric to see to his duties and see to the souls of the slain. They will continue their quest tomorrow. Plans were made for the dwarves to take the wounded back to the capital using one of their airships in the morning. As the sun rose on a new day, the knights saw the airships the dwarves arrived on. The previous night they had been powered down and far enough away that the firelight did not reach them. Lumbering beasts encased in armor and bristling with guns. With these as their new allies, the knight thought the war will surely turn in their favor. A whining noise could be heard in the distance, as a single helicopter could be seen on the horizon, must be a scout sent out by the dwarves. As the captain watched the dwarf machine come closer and land in clearing near the large airships, the cleric burst from his tent. I have had another vision. The angel she calls to us. She is at the river fortress. Calming the cleric down, the captain rouses the knights from their tents and tells them to get ready to march. As he is gathering his bedrolls, a dwarf engineer tells the captain their scout has been to the river fortress, and it appears that another great battle had happened. The dwarfs are preparing to travel there as well, and they will be watching over them from the air. Great roars came from the engines of the airships, as they were roused to life ranks of dwarf warriors and riflemen entered the loading ramps of the ships. Human wounded were led by the hand into the holds of one of the ships. The fortress was a few hours' ride, and as they approached what could be described as a forest of dead trees could be seen surrounding the walls. As the knights got closer, they were awestruck by what it actually was. Thousands of pikes stood in the rocky ground. At the tops of each there were bodies, and parts of bodies. Each of them was a member of the Havoc army with open throats and bellies. The smell of the decaying remains nearly overpowered the knights. The cleric wrapped his robes across his mouth and nose and they continued onto the fortress. The gates of the fortress were smashed in, the ten-meter doors smashed to splinters. 
As they entered, there was a blur of darkness, and an angel stood before them, its skin an alabaster white in a suit of glossy black armor with wings that resembled a raven. In its hands, it held a sword easily the height of a man. The angel raised its head, and where its face should have been there was nothing, its features missing from its head to its chin just blank like an egg. It raised a hand to its side and pointed to a raised stone platform. As the knights looked, reality seemed to ripple, and the pale angel appeared on the platform where she was not a heartbeat before. Welcome, my children. I have been expecting you. The cleric jumped off his horse and hit his knees, praising the pale angel. The rest of the team dismounted, and with a few glances at each other, they also fell to one knee in front of the angel. While the holy men saw the angel as a divine conqueror, sent to burn away the filth of havoc from the scorched valley. In the minds of some of the men, thoughts started to form. Just what kind of being are they following? This week's viewer campaign mission is The Dwarf Strike Force has moved to assault the Havoc Dwarfs in their mountain holds. This mission card assumes the game is being played on a 6 foot by 4 foot board. If you are using a different sized battlefield, adjust the measurements accordingly. Both players deploy 12 inches on the long side of the board. There are three objective. Two are set up 18 inches in from the board edge and 18 inches away from the Havoc Dwarf deployment zone. The third objective is set up 36 inches from the short board edge and 18 inches from the dwarf deployment zone. As a player, you are not limited to using dwarf or havoc dwarf armies. Both players can use any army to fight for the alliance or the forces of havoc. The special twist in this mission is, the dwarfs have access to their airships for rapid deployment to the battlefield. To represent this, the dwarf army can give the ambush rule to three units in the army for this battle. The battle should last four turns or until an army routes. If both players agree to it, then a no-retreat rule may be added in. Because of the hatred between these two forces, morale tests are considered to always be passed, and the mission continues until one army has no more units on the board. That will be all the news from the front this month. Thank you for watching, and we will return to the Scorched Valley next month to see what the next step of the campaign holds.